are you? Good. Anybody there? Good. <laughs> Who here has heard of stuffocation? Brilliant, three of you. Who here has heard of Eventbrite? Okay, who's used Eventbrite? Who's used it to organize an event? Did it work? Was it good? Actually, I'm, I'm putting my hand up. That's because of Julia. Ah, uh, now we can go. Bye-bye, no, thank true. you. No, but it's really. Um, okay, we're, we're here to have a conversation about experiences and why they matter. And um, Can we Julia, talk about suffocation first, though? Why don't we talk about how we met, how, we met, how okay. you came across my work? So, for those of you who haven't read Stefication, um, it, it is really worth the read. And I'm somebody who sort of hates business books because I feel like there's one great core concept and then it gets blown out with sort of and, and filled in with marshmallow fluff to make a book. Am I right? Marshmallow make, fluff is always money. In and books. so um, I discovered Stefication through a Wired article that sort of broke down the core concept of what uh, James has spent years sort of researching and putting together as a writer, and, and really about the idea that experiences trump material goods when it comes to human happiness and well-being. And a lot of what he has talked about in his book, which I have now read most of, uh, is in line with sort of the core concept and philosophy that we have at Eventbrite. And it sort of felt like I was reading my own thoughts on paper, so that was creepy. And so I became obsessed with, um, with James and he was kind enough to meet me out here in Vegas. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to jump in here because this is definitely not just going to be some sort of weird loving. I promise <laughs> you that. Because it, when I met Julia and I, I talked to some of her colleagues, it was really weird because as they talked to me about what Eventbrite is all about, it felt like they were pitching the idea of my book to me. And I'm just yeah. going to give you a little bit of my background. I'm a cultural uh, forecaster. I've been doing this for about 10 years. And, um, what is a cultural forecaster? Cultural forecaster. Yeah, tell us more about oh, what okay. that means. So, so what I do is I work for companies like Absolute and BMW and Zurich Finance and help them understand what the future is going to be so that they can prepare better for that future. Mm. And um, you guys come across the diffusion of innovations. Mm -hmm. You know this thing, this, this curve, which starts with the... It, it describes how ideas spread through any community. And it was first um, put together by a sociologist in Iowa in 1962, a guy called Everett Rogers and it explains how ideas spread through a community. So they could, it starts with the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. You seen this S-curve? We the talk thing is, about it, that a lot at Eventbrite, actually. Say again? We talk about that oh, okay. a lot at Eventbrite. Okay. And the thing is about this is if you, re, if you can read that curve right, what you can do is you can see where things are going to end up. You can work out what the future is going to be, and you can see it here happening in the present. Because if you look at what the innovators and the early adopters are doing today, you can see what everyone else is going to be doing tomorrow. So that's, that's, my, 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 that's my background. And then it's my belief that um, our culture is fundamentally changing. Mm -hmm. And we used to be materialistic, and materialism was a great thing for the 20th century. It transformed standards of living. And here in the 21st century, instead of having the problem of scarcity, we now have the problem of abundance. You know, we have so much stuff that I can write a book called Stuffocation and people get what it's about. And, and now we're moving from materialism to what I call experientialism. So instead of looking for happiness, identity, status, and meaning in material things and stuff, we're finding happiness, identity, status, and meaning in experiences instead, the sort of experiences that Eventbrite put together. Right. And what, what's really interesting for me is that, so my job is to look around culture, look at you know, statistics, both quant and qual evidence, that, that, illustrate that this is happening. And it's interesting for me in that I can see that this is happening, but you're someone who's actually making it happen. Mm. I would love to hear, if you would share this, why you started Eventbrite in the first place. You know, was, it, was it a passion for experiences for yourself? Or you know, was there a problem organizing something? What, what, I, I uh, for years, well, so we founded Eventbrite in 2006, which is, we're closing in on 10 years. Um, and the sort of the profoundness of, of length of time is not lost on me. But in 2006, I wish I had one of those sexy stories where it was like I couldn't find a great event to attend, sort of like the couch story or, you know. But I, I really, I don't, and I'm not going to make one up. Um, we, we were passionate about the idea that technology could democratize industries. And I think that the core concept that event Eventbrite was born from this nucleus of online payment processing being sort of this groundbreaking technology that allowed anyone to become a merchant. And what kind of different industries could you not just, not really disrupt, but democratize? 
create this enablement where there wasn't an opportunity to begin with. And so before Eventbrite, you really couldn't can sell I just, tickets. Can I just jump Please. in here? Is this a very kind of Californian, West Coast technology kind of idea? Do a lot of you have this kind of sense <laughs> that what you're trying to do is make the world a better place through technology, democratize things, bring it to everybody? Is that a general thing? Somebody nod at me. We generally believe that. Thank you. I saw a couple of nods. <laughs> but that's my impression. What, what do you yeah. think of that? Do you think well, come from that? Yeah, I mean, I think that for us, technology is not the evil. It's not sort of the, you know, uh, sc screens are not the enemy. We yeah. find that actually by filling this gap, this need in the market where people can actually gather others around great passions or causes or interests and create experiences and do that in a self-service manner and actually be successful, is the technology is the is is the way in which we got from A to B. I mean, without this open platform, we wouldn't have been able to enable millions of people to gather. And so when I look at the sort of volume that exists on Eventbrite, you know, we ticketed 1.7 million events last year. And that is only possible through the mechanism of technology, of being able to discover uh, events, being able to promote events, and being able to transact tickets online in a way that's super easy, and we didn't have that before Eventbrite. Can I ask you a question? In terms of, do you think that more people are getting together in live events now because of platforms like Eventbrite? And, and whether you believe it, is, <laughs> do you have any stats to back it up? Yeah, I mean, so we did some research last year when we realized that we were sitting on this sort of treasure trove of data with you know, 30 million active consumers using Eventbrite um, and actually buying tickets to types of events that people didn't even know existed. I mean, 10 years ago, really nobody heard of a mud run, right? But now it's sort of all the rage with Tough Mudder and color runs and any type of run you could possibly imagine. These sort of cultural trends are emerging on Eventbrite. So we dug into the consumer data and we actually um, paired up with Harris Research last year to really understand what is the propensity towards attending live experiences? Who are those people who are actually going out and experiencing life in the way that you outline in the book, which is making their life better? And why do they do that? And what we found is an overwhelming majority of live event goers right now um, are millennials. So not, not a huge sort of surprise since millennials are quickly becoming the largest living generation in our, in our time. They're about 27% of, um, of the US population and about $1.3 trillion in spending. So it's interesting to look at sort of how millennials are driving the experiences generation forward. And what we found is that three and four millennials would choose to spend money on experiences over things. And again, three, three, and, three four. and four. Okay. I've and seen statistics from American Express that said, um, I think across the population in the States, it was 73% yeah. prefer experiences over stuff. So very similar kind of stats. Right. And um, one of the stats that I found really astounding is that festivals are becoming this way in which people are able to gather around common interests, right? So you could even call this a festival of sorts. There's many different things going on. It's not just your, your, your uh, usual business and tech conference. But um, last year, Eventbrite, on the Eventbrite platform, we had 50,000 festivals uh, 50, ticketed, 50,000 festivals ticketed around the world, so not just the US. But when we pulled US consumers and specifically millennials on their um, thoughts and feelings towards festivals, what, like one in five had gone to a festival in the last year. So it's this really strong category that's showing a tremendous amount of growth. And from our perspective, that tells us that there is this huge appetite for people to gather in that type of environment um, where it's usually around a common interest or passion, but you're seeing sort of many more festivals come to fruition that are even deeper. They're sort of niche in, in um, like areas that you wouldn't expect. Very interesting areas. Okay. I just Te led myself okay. into I want to hear about some of those areas. <laughs> I really want to hear about, obviously, as someone who's interested in trends and how culture is changing, I'm interested to hear um, what trends you might have seen. Particularly, I'm thinking, there's, there's, there's some information in the UK at the moment that shows that people are moving away from the big festivals yeah. to smaller festivals. <laughs> and, and, you know, kind of, obviously, Coachella's been incredibly successful here in recent years. Mm. But are you seeing people moving from the bigger to the smaller? And yeah. as, a, as another question to go with that is in terms of where does technology come in? Obviously, it's facilitating the smaller ones. What does it do for the bigger ones? So, you know, one of the most interesting things about um, Coachella as sort of the, uh, I guess, gold standard of multi-day music festivals, Coachella's done something that's actually quite tremendous. So back in 2007, 
they made a very controversial decision to live stream in high def for free the entire festival. And back then, the festival industry, especially multi-day music festivals, which are an entire beast in themselves, it was a smaller industry. And that industry was terrified that Coachella's decision as a market leader would actually cannibalize their ticket sales. And what you see is, I have this uh, interesting graph that shows their, their ticket sales actually tripled. They ended up, I, I think at that point, adding an extra day. There are now 90,000 people over, three, over, over two weekends. And, um, and you see this tremendous growth because what they did was they created FOMO, like before we even knew that acronym, which was if you were at home watching Coachella, you know, live from your bed, maybe I've done that, maybe I've not, but uh, you, you really do actually want to be have there. You done that? I have totally done that, yeah. Anyone else watch this Coachella live feed? Can I ask why? Because I don't know about you, if I, because they do it in the UK as well, they, they'll play like Glastonbury, which is the big one in the UK. Yeah. And I just watch it, I think, oh my God, I want to be there. I can't watch this right. any longer. I mean, I understand it, but I find it quite painful. You do. Yeah, you actually you feel pain. Yeah, That's you, you carry on watching yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. You guys carry on watching? Okay. <laughs> All right. For me, it's just we're, too painful. I turn it off, I do something it. else. I'm like, I want to be having, you know, the experience that I'm having. But, I, but <laughs> so I think, I think on the other end of the spectrum, which is really where Eventbrite, um, our, our core market are the small to medium size if we're staying in festivals, but really it's a multi-category yeah. e-commerce business. We have every type of event you could possibly imagine. The woman we met earlier who's doing the cannabis right. tech the cannab meetup cannabis in uh, Colorado. Yeah. Isn't that just the best yeah. thing ever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Biggest cheer for he marijuana in US. tech. Great. Um, so for the smaller events, technology is so incredibly crucial in the discovery of that type of event. And I think that's where Eventbrite plays a big role, which is, you know, we have millions of active consumers, we have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of organizers, and how do we actually put them together? I think the big challenge for us moving forward as we sort of near our, our 10 year anniversary is, how do we create that global marketplace? Okay. Because we have the inventory, we have these, this wealth of live experiences that are off the beaten path. So they're not sort of the big headline festivals, but they're the more niche okay. festivals. All right, let's and talk about those. So this, this is the pivot that you've been talking about, isn't it? Eventbrite's going from a facilitator of events to kind of helping people find events, right? I call right? it an evolution. Okay, because sorry. Because I think a pivot comes into play when the direction you're going isn't okay, working I, out. Who said pivot or evolution? Evolution. Come on, people. E pivot? <laughs> All right, I'll take that pivot, that one. <laughs> okay, now tell us, I don't know about you, but I want to know about the weird events, don't you? Yeah, yeah. The, tr the trends in events are interesting. But so let's talk about trends and the weird events. I mean, do you have uh, furries? Do they have meetups? We have really weird events. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing about being an open platform and a self-service platform is you have to be agnostic, right? So obviously we have standards and, you know, all sorts of stuff. I was going to say, do you have weird religious sort of, cults as well? Um, I, I don't call them weird. Okay, I mean, sorry. So so Alternative. I love all God's children. So the the, the um, spectrum sort of uh, is a wild one. I mean, we have yes, we have special interest groups uh, alongside of you know religious groups. We name have, them. Come we on, have name the, some of them. I know you want me to name them. I actually find the ones that are most interesting to be the huge phenomenon. So emerging trends like esports, where sixty thousand people are going to an arena to watch a video game being played is amazing. I mean, I think that that are, in itself is incredible. But they're organizing for 60,000 people on Eventbrite. Yes. Oh, so okay. these are the sort of the, the emerging sub-trends that we get to see. We call them sub-categories because they're, ca they're, they're sort of parts of these bigger categories. I also think that um, the whole phenomenon of Tough Mudder is insane. Who here has done Tough Mudder? Wow. Wow. I mean, that's... So these people that are just raised their hands at some point have low crawled through a mud bath while being electrically charged, as well as gone in through something called the Arctic enema, which I don't even want to like pretend that I know how that feels. <laughs> um, and this is a rising trend yeah, yeah. all over the world. Mm -hmm. Millions of people are doing these obstacle races. And again, this is what you talk about. Yeah. And, they're, and, they're, and they're doing it because it's a badge of honor. It's something that connects you to other people. It's pretty much the best team sport you can ever imagine when you survive one of those. And as you do more, you start to sort of gain this, I don't even want to call it social capital because it's way bigger than that. 
but there's this self-worth that you gain through going through an experience like that that you can't get from buying a new pair of Nikes. I'm sorry. This is what I was going to say. So I think one of the reasons why I think we're shifting from materialism to experientialism, finding happiness and status, and status is very important to humans. You know, it's, it's, it's the flip side of the coin of identity. It's how we express ourselves to other people is because of social media. It's because of the fact that when you do a, a tough mother or a tough guy, not only are you doing it, but you get to post it on Facebook or exactly. Twitter or whatever, and you have all your friends on Facebook or your followers on Twitter who will see what you do. And if you think back to the 20th century, the best way to get status and to express who you were was through stuff. Because back then, nobody knew that you'd, that you'd been to um, Vegas for the weekend, you'd been to South by Southwest, you'd been to a collision conference, you'd been to the latest pop-up restaurant, you'd done a Tough Mudder. But they would see you with your big watch on your arm, your, um, you know, the car that you drove, the handbag that you had. And that's all changed because of social media, which is really supporting this shift from materialism to experientialism. There's a woman called Alice Marwick, some of you guys may have come across, she, she did a four-year study, I think she's at Microsoft now, and she did a four-year study for a PhD where she specifically looked at people in Silicon Valley but in the uh, social media scene and looked at how they lived and how they got status. And she, one of the conclusions of her four-year study was that acceptable conspicuous consumption has changed. It's no longer yeah. about having stuff, it's about what you do. Yeah. And that's why experiences are so important. I think it's a really good thing. What you said there about social capital and your sense of self-worth, I saw this guy who's shooting this documentary in the, uh, all around, actually. He's based here in the States. I saw him in the UK. And he's looking at how it's, it changes our sense of who we are. You know, if you buy stuff and you seek status and happiness external to who you are, it leads to a kind of culture of personality, you know, ex a, 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 external to who you are, an expression of a kind of a persona, that kind of mask, as opposed to a culture of character, which is much more important and leads to much more happiness. And if you seek to find happiness and identity and status through what you do, you get a stronger sense of self. Right. And that richer sense of self leads to greater happiness. I call I them indelible memories. I mean, we all uh, you know, absorb and digest terabytes of information every day in our news feeds. And you probably you know, can't really remember much about what you read the day before. And mm. yet, this moment, today, you'll likely have an indelible memory that you'll be able to this recall. Talk, this talk between this the two of us, right? This moment right here, right now. One of the things you say in your book that I love is the idea that experiences trump material goods because even if the experience is bad, which might be this talk, um, <laughs> there's like the worse it is, the better the positive reinterpretation and sort of the, the and, and yeah. so, the, well actually there's a positive reinterpretation where it's better than it actually was, but then there's also, if it was really bad, the great stories that you get to tell from it. And I thought that was such a good point, is that the, yeah, the adaptation part. And that's like, my concern about this in conversation between Julia and I. If it's okay, you won't remember it. And in many yeah. ways we should make it really bad. If it's going south, make it worse. Is it really bad? Is it memorably <laughs> bad? Have we failed you in some way? But this, this idea of positive reinterpretation for... is really important. There's, there are about seven or eight key reasons why experiences are better than material goods that make us happier. And as you said, the positive reinterpretation is one of the best. You know when you've been on one of those cross-country trips, you know, in Peru or India or something, and you've been on a bus, <laughs> and the person next to you has been sick, and the trip, instead of taking seven hours, has taken 12 hours. It's been painfully hot or painfully cold. And it's, you know, there's chickens on the bus and it's just really unpleasant. No. <laughs> it sounds like this happened you know, to you. Yeah, of course yeah, it's, no, happened. Yeah, it's happened. Yeah. This happened to all of us, hasn't it? Well, it's a little extreme. I don't know if it's something that I would like Okay, identify what's, what's the worst with? thing that's ever happened to you? Uh, probably likely, oh, being pulled off a plane because our six-year-old beat her passport didn't have more than uh, eight months on it. Okay, and we at the time you were really, really that pissed was the worst, off, right? Yeah, I'll and never forget that moment. I was going to say, it's not a great story, is it? You've killed this. No. We didn't rehearse this, as you can tell. <laughs> Julia should have told, at that point, Julia should have told a really great anecdote. But what she did was... I went to the worst thing that's ever happened mean? to me. What is Sorry? Oh, we, we couldn't go to Greece. We, we, okay. could, we had to get off the plane. So it killed your holiday? Yeah. But actually, we you tell that story all the time because it ended, up, <laughs> it ended up great. We have a great story. I'm not going to take the 20 seconds that we have to tell it, but the I think you make a really no, good no, point. No, tell that story because that is really hard to positively interpret a situation where your <laughs> holiday hasn't happened. But genuinely, I mean, these other reasons, one of the, I'm going to mention flow. Flow is so important. It's very hard. If you, put your, if you think you're going to find happiness in a pair of shoes or a piece of furniture, 
it's very hard to focus on material goods. But when you're doing something, even if you're getting thrown <laughs> off a plane and you can't go to Greece on holiday, at least you're doing something. We ended up in Greece. That's oh, you did go to Greece? Part. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole long story. Everyone between. was happy. Does somebody come along and ask us to go? <laughs> yeah, no. I we think go. I think they start booing and then we leave. Okay. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. I do very much recommend that you read Wally's book, Stefication. It's got the seven the reasons home. why experience is better than material goods. And if for nothing else, it's a really useful read, I think, for that. But also, technology is changing the way that we exist. And it means that we don't have to have loads of stuff anymore. Amen to that. Amen. Thanks, guys. And here's to experiences. <laughs> Thanks.